okay so we have been talking about animation right so if you recall we basically have looked at various animation techniques uh, the main or let's say the major techniques could be classified into techniques of rotoscopy which is extremely data intensive then we have techniques involving key framing right which is very popular so here the idea is that you try to generate certain key frames and then using some sort of interpolation you create animation through those key frames and then we also looked at parametric animations where the key framing could be formed as parameters which drive animation rather than the complete shape of the key frame right and there are also methods which are algorithmic which more or less attempts to simulate the process being governed by a physical law or certain heuristics you have in mind okay so it's it's an algorithmic animation so in fact one can also look at these techniques in a different uh, form for instance rotoscopy could uh, now in modern day animation can be looked at as a technique of motion capture right where you trying to capture the motion from a real performer and then try to use that information for generating animation you can also have a scripted animation where you write a script consisting of various commands involving maybe let's say keyframe animation or parametric animation all right and you can also have procedural animation where you set the procedure of animation maybe based on a physics law or a law of motion or it could be a procedure which is designed by you right so it's a procedural animation so these are similar ideas as these but with a different nomenclature right so we had looked at uh, an example of say key framing animation in the context of morphing right image morphing so just to recapitulate what we looked at last time so there were uh, so the the problem was stated in the form that you have a source image and you have a target image and what you want to generate is a metamorphism between the source and the target right so that means you start from the source and you reach the target preserving what the target is and in between you have some sort of a blend between source and target right and in order to have the realistic transition from source to target it is necessary that there is some sort of a feature identification which you or the animator provides as the corresponding features between the source and the target right so that you preserve those features during transition right so once these feature points are identified then in the triangular method you triangulate these points which are feature points that means you basically establish a coordinate system for the rest of the points in terms of the feature points you have given as corresponding points okay so triangular method is one of the ways of doing it and once you have done that then you perform an interpolation of the triangulation for getting the intermediate frames so both in terms of the spatial information which gives you a some sort of a warping function right from one uh, frame to another frame and also then you perform the interpolation for the color or the intensity in information to find the intermediate frame right so that's what we had looked at 
last time right so there is another way to do the similar process and in fact uh, just because of the popularity i thought i'll tell you so this is similar to what triangular method is except that you're establishing the features as feature lines in the image okay instead of specifying points and thereby using triangles as corresponding primitives between the images you are using these feature lines so you are saying that this line matches to this line so this is the corresponding line in the target okay so this is due to uh, beer and neely in 1992 and in fact that's where they had created the the famous animation of the morphing clips of michael jackson right so uh so this was appeared in sigraf 1992 so here again the problem is that you need to find out given this pixel let's say in the source and how do you transform this pixel into the target image so you knowing that this line corresponds to this line in the target image right so again you need to have some sort of a coordinate system which would locate this point in relation to the feature line you have specified right so that you can do the proper interpolation for the points right so again uh, this coordinate system is established through the parameters u which is along the line right and then v which is the orthonormal distance from the line okay so this way you locate this point so similarly the same u and v would locate this point okay so these are equivalent to some sort of barycentric coordinates which we had seen in the triangle method okay so clearly this i am showing it with respect to single line right but there will be situations where you would actually specify multiple lines of features correspondence between the source and the target so there could be a situation then there is one line here and there is another line here and so on right so a point here would actually get affected by more than one line with this system of establishing coordinates right so you need to have some sort some sort of a weighting or weight factors associated to these coordinates right so one of the ways uh, uh, by which you can do is that you can some sort of define the uh, a decay function right so closer to the line you get influenced by this line right as you go farther from this line the influence is reduced right and so so basically some sort of a an attenuation of distance from the various lines this this point may get influenced right okay so so this is another way of doing the same thing instead of using a triangle method you use feature line method fine in fact it is uh, thought that sometimes it's easier to identify primitives like line which would be considered as corresponding features rather than points okay so that way these methods have certain advantage to point wise method okay so another uh, so we also looked at the application of these methods so i gave you certain examples where you saw the morphing 
So, this is I am repeating uh, from last time just to elaborate on what actually is involved in this application. So, let me just show you. What. So, here you see that there is an utterance of a sentence which was given as an input as a text right, which was processed to figure out the atomic units of speech which are the phonemes and the counterparts the visual counterparts of those phonemes which we call as vision right. So, and then what you have is a snapshot of certain characteristic visiums right a o p and so on. So, there is a chosen set of these visiums which are just the snapshots stills and then what you are trying to do is some sort of a morphing between those visiums when you run through a sentence. Right. So, for instance, if you are saying 2, then it is a combination of T and O, right? then you mix these visiums during your animation. Right. And the correspondence since we are taking the entire image is actually hard to do either using triangular method or using feature line based method. In fact, there is a method known as optical flow which helps determining the correspondence for the dense uh, pixels. Okay. So, it actually gives you correspondence for each pixel in the source and the target. Okay. So, using that you establish the correspondence and then do the morphing. Okay. So, obviously, when you look at the, the eye motion this was not done using that because when these utterances were taken for the vision the both the times the eyes were open. Right. So, this was like an additional feature overlaid on this. Okay. So, for instance one can do a masking of eyes. Right. So, you do not display the eyes or you have one key frame as a close eye and then one key frame as an open eye and then you again run through morphing. Right. So, this is an overlay on the on the speech okay. and this is another example. So, uh, the head motion what you observe is actually an artifact which was not an intention. Okay. It is a the subject is not supposed to move the head because otherwise you lose the information of correspondence. Right. When you are doing the correspondence, you want the snapshots to be in the same same uh, neutral head position. Right. So, uh, but the feature here, uh, in fact, which was intended was to demonstrate the articulation of speech. So, what do we mean by articulation? Basically, when you utter a word. So, depending on the preceding and the succeeding phonemes, the current phoneme shape is formed. Right? It is not an independent entity after all. It very much depends on the preceding and the succeeding phonemes. Right? So, so, that means one has to take some sort of a window in which you can perform the blending of these phonemes. It is not just the pairwise blending, but you may have to take a window of phonemes where you need to perform the blending. Right. So, one, one needs to perform some sort of a ranking of phonemes. There are phonemes which are dominating, there are phonemes which are less dominating. Right. So, th those problems are addressed for coarticulation. So, in fact, one uh, another thing which you observe is uh, this is completely image based. 
right? So everything is done on an image. But one can do a similar process using a model. So what do I mean by that? Basically, you construct a say a three-dimensional model of a face, right? And in order to add a realistic display of that, you may use texture mapping. That is to map the information of such a realistic face onto the model, right? That can be achieved through texture mapping. And then it becomes a matter of moving those points on the mesh, right? Which is which is giving you the model of the head which could be done parametrically or which could be done by other methods right in fact you can go to the extent of defining muscular structures within those models and then pull these muscles giving forces to those muscles to see the deformation of the mesh so this this can become as complicated as you want it to be right so so those are model based techniques right so the advantage there is that you have much more flexibility because you have a model here you are fixed with a particular subject and the database of that subject right so there is a, a there is a plethora of research activity around this so this has been on for about 20 30 years okay all right so so this was just to do a recapitulation of what we saw last time in image morphing and give you this example now next thing which you are going to look at is uh, and another way of doing animation and in fact uh, what I am going to talk about which is particle systems can be used for animation but can also be used for some other purposes okay. modeling in general let us say. Okay. So, so the initial attempts uh, with respect to particle systems started in 1983 from a SIGGRAPH paper by William Reeves, where he gave particle system as a technique for modeling a class of fuzzy objects. Okay. So fuzzy means something which is sort of random, something similar to random fractals. right? So, the nature is stochastic. So, uh, so let us see what these particle system are. So, what are uh, what happens in particle system is that first of all the representation of an object is in terms of cloud of particles. Right. So, you are thinking of an object to be represented as bunch of particles, lots of particles, right. And these particles are not static in general, particularly when you are performing animation. So, that means this particle system, which is collection of these hundreds and thousands of particles, it evolves right over a period of time and it is non deterministic, it is stochastic, right. So, there is a randomness in the process and the, the idea behind is that you are basically trying to do a representation in the form of particles which are simple in shape, sim simple in, in uh, performing computation. Right. So, to gain some computational efficiency, you choose this representation of just collection of points let us say. Right. But they can actually model very complex amorphous phenomena, objects and behaviors. Okay. So, some of the examples are for instance dust, 
waterfall, rain, fire, cloud, stars, grass and so on. Right? So, otherwise if you choose some primitive geometric primitive to do the proper modeling of these phenomena, it is going to be extremely computationally intensive. So, these particle systems allow you to capture the characteristic behavior of such phenomena. Okay. So, so, when we are dealing with these particle systems in a in a typical particle system you you have uh, a generation of particles. So, you generate new particles with initial attributes right. So, we are we are going to look at what are these attributes and these particles have a lifespan ok. So, that means they die after a certain time or they disappear right. In terms of computation you may you may still have the allocation for that particle on in the memory, but you do not display right. So, you kill off these dead particles you do not show them or remove them and then uh, the, the evolution requires you to have a modification of the attributes of the particle in terms of position, in terms of color and other attributes ok. And then there is a process of rendering these particles which stay in the system fine. So, let us see uh, one by one these processes. So, we are looking at a process of generation right particle generation which is stochastic stochastic in the sense that at certain time you generate some number of particles in a particle system, which could be determined by the average number of particles at that instance. There is some randomness and then there is this variance, which will keep changing depending on at what instance of time you are generating these particles right. So, that makes the process of getting these particles as stochastic right. Now, uh, the attributes basically determine the motion status of the particles right. That means, the position, the velocity and so on the appearance of these particles right, the size, the shape and its life in the particle system ok. So, these are the attributes of a particle ok. So, this is just an example position, color, opacity, size, speed, lifespan and so on right. And so, these attributes need to be initialized at the time of creation right. So, you have certain values to be given at the time of creation of particle system right ok. So, now then there is this we said that particles have a lifespan. So, they would terminate at some instance of time. So, for each new frame basically you have a subtraction of the time which it has been elapsed from the life of the particle right. So, particles lifetime is decremented by 1 or by some factor whichever procedure you have determined right. And when the life time equals to 0 that means, the particle has to be removed it is dead right. So, for instance you may have at the time of creation a particle with these attributes the size and the color and the position right. Then you have say a law of 
motion or the procedure in which this particle has to move over a period of time. So, it goes from here so at some point of time this is the state of the particle where the attributes have changed according to the procedure you had given or the law you had given right. So, the size has reduced the color has changed and so on it hits this and comes here and at this instance the particle is dead right. So, this sort of shows the evolution of the particle ok. So, uh, so what we said is that to be able to do the animation of particles either you may have a procedural animation right. So, where you have described a procedure for the animation of particle or you may actually use some dynamics or law of motion which performs the animation of particle. So, for instance if you want to use dynamics then we are looking at finding out the terms like acceleration, velocity and position given certain forces on the particle right. And simultaneously you may change attributes of particles for instance you may change color of the particle, the opacity of the particle, the time right. So, this is what performs in the sense of evolution of particle system ok. So, when I said that you basically can determine terms like acceleration, velocity and position of a particle. So, let us say if we are looking at the basic law of motion of Newton f is equal to m a right. So, we are looking at this f which is the force term determined through the position at the instance i, the velocity at i and time t right. So, these uh, and this term gives me the acceleration f over m i where m is the mass of the particle. So, this is sort of the Euler approximation when you do the numerical solution of this differential equation because f is equal to m a is nothing but a differential equation right, where a is here d x square plus d, 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 d x square by d d square right. So, so, this differential equation when you solve you have this approximation right, where you compute the new velocity from the old velocity at the time interval <coughs> delta t. So, if you have the delta t as the time interval this is your new velocity and from this new velocity you can compute the new position of the particle right. So, it is a simple uh, law of dynamics which you can use for finding out the new position and the new velocity of the particle. Okay. So, now the question of rendering of these particles is concerned. So, we simplify lots of things to be able to render a huge number of particles. So, for instance particles are considered as light sources that means they will be emitting lights and nothing else will be happening. So, they are just light sources they would not intersect with objects. So, they would not particles and particles would not collide let us say because otherwise finding out collision between the particles is computationally intensive. You may even ignore shadows of particles on particles. You may have shadows of the entire particle system on a on a ground plane or something that may be easier thing to compute, but you may not have particle to particle shadows that means self shadows 
So, these are assumptions just to simplify the process of rendering of these particles just because the number which we use for particle systems is huge right thousands and sometimes millions of particles. Right. Okay, so, these are some examples for instance uh, all of you must have done if they do if you do not do these days during Diwali you must have used lots of these firecrackers and other fireworks. So, they can be actually modeled using particle systems right. So, here in fact you have the, the this is the the origin of particle system where these particles are getting generated right and during the evolution you see the the color attributes keep changing with the position and the velocity and so on and then at certain point of time they just disappear that is why you get this impression of some particles alive some particles not alive right. So, this decay of particles is very important to the process of evolution of particle system right. So, this is also some sort of a comet thing this is a waterfall right. So, this is all synthetic by the way there is no real picture here. Right. So, so all the particles are being sort of generated at some source they follow a certain motion and along with the attributes keep changing over a period of time right. So, you can get fairly nice uh, simulation of these phenomena right ok. Uh, this you might know right of Khan is another example have you been watching Star Trek that is not your generation right. Okay, so uh, in 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 early 80s, I think this Star Trek came, Star Trek 2. So there was this uh, showing the process of genesis, and uh, so there the, the the this was some sort of a uh, model of the the planet, and the idea was that they were showing that how this genesis takes place. So, lots of particles were generated and emanated from the surface of this planet right giving you the impression of an explosion and the fire from this ok. So, the idea was that uh, they got generated in concentric rings from the point of impact. So, number of uh, systems of particles were actually based on the circumfer circumference of the rings right and uh, the new fire particles based on the distance from the impact crater were generated right. So, and then you also had some sort of a process of explosion. So, you have a some initial position and, and direction in which the particle would start right and in a in a typical zone what you will have is some attribute of ejection angle right. So, it is a sort of a frustum. So, you have particles which are straight vertical and there are particles which are at an angle. So, this ejection angle was also an attribute to those particles ok. So, with these uh, attributes and properties, so there is also an initial speed assigned to these particles. Uh, so, this is the kind of impression created. So, let me show you this clip. 
So, this was all done using particle system and this was done uh, by then Lucas film nowadays called as ILM industrial light in magic. So, it is actually a, a company which does uh, lots of special effects. There are other examples, right. So, this is a simulation of smoke coming from a cigarette. This is also done using particle system. So, you may have the as I said the attributes could be color opacity or the transparency. So, that is an attribute you can use it for simulating smoke and, and fire, right. This is another example which is actually doing the modeling of this grass clump. Okay. So, in fact, uh, a particle is considered as a blade of grass right? and you are drawing the parabolic streak over the entire lifetime of the particle. So, it just keeps drawing these parabolic streaks right which is the the uh, evolution procedure you have given to the particle right which gives you the impression of this grass clump and of course you can keep changing the color attributes right so some of them may appear more yellow some of them are green and so on right so here you notice that there is a shadow Right, this is a shadow actually on the ground plane of this grass clump. There are no shadows from grass to grass, but there is a shadow on the ground plane. Okay. So, this could be done using uh, some sort of a projection of these, these shape primitives onto a plane. Right. So, this is relatively easier than computing the self shadows of these particles. Right. So, you can even do the modeling of natural phenomena not just the process of animation right. Okay. So, other things you can also uh, further extend the idea of particle system for instance doing behavioral animation. So, for instance, you want to uh, simulate the process of flocking of birds. Right? So, you notice that when the birds fly at some point they come together right? some sort of a banking of these birds and then they split and so on. Right? So, they have a very uh, sort of a known behavior when they do this flocking. Right? So, that can be modeled using particle systems. So, think those particles now to be like birds right? and give them behavior through the procedure of a particle animation. Right? Here of course, the issues would come in terms of collision avoidance. So, there is a tendency what when you notice flocking there is an implicit leader to the flock. All birds tend to go towards that leader right and the leader guides the whole navigation right. However, there is no collision obviously of those birds right. So, when you are doing this process simulating the flocking you will have to account for collision avoidance right which is computationally quite intensive. You can also, yes. No, it does not prevent us calling those birds as objects. I am actually saying that those birds are like particles, right. So, these particles are, are not just points in all situations, right. So, in other examples where we observe 
these particles were more or less like point entities, clouds of points, right. Now, you can actually uh, use not just the point, but any of the primitive or an object to be called as a particle, right. So, all you are saying is that there is a cloud of primitives and then there is a behavior of these primitives, right, as a system and as an individual primitive. Right. You can also do a uh, modeling of things like deformable objects. Right. For instance, here what we are basically trying to achieve, let us say if you are doing a modeling of cloth. So, cloth is a is a deformable object, right. It is an elastic kind of an object, it can deform. So, so, here we are taking the particles in the form of node points in the mesh connected through springs. Right. So, in other words, uh, let us see. For instance, you may consider and these are nothing but some sort of particles, right? And these are connected to the neighboring particles through springs. Okay. So, what will happen is that this point will deform as a function of the spring here in these four links. And then each of these particle or node point will actually deform as a consequence of a spring action, which is the connectivity of the two particles. Right? And then you would observe as a sum of the behavior, the total behavior would be a deformable mesh, right, which can look like this, which is a deformable cloth, right. So, so one can do simulation of cloth or garments using particle systems. So, more of it you will see in the course 2. Okay. Uh, similarly, you can also have things like hair or strands or fur, right, those objects. So, there you are basically modeling a strand, right, which is nothing but line connections with springs of these particles or the node points, right. So, there for instance, we are talking of these things, right. So, here this is connected to this and this is connected to this and each one of them is something like a spring. So, they will contract and expand and thereby cause a deformation. Hmm? Or bend, see they may not always be deformable along the axis, they may actually bend. That is a typical thing which will happen to hair for instance. Right? So, these are uh, some examples where you can use particle systems. Right? So, let us stop here. Uh, next time we will talk on something else. Thank you.